on, honestly, like, it is hard, but that's that's just part of the game. Like, in any creative pursuit, like, you're gonna constantly <laughs> be wrestling with that. Um, so you just gotta keep on moving forward and always recognize that, like, your stuff will get better. Like, take the criticism, take it in and evaluate it, you know, because it may be that there's stuff you can really learn from it. Mm -hmm. There also may be some criticism that isn't worth listening to, mm -hmm. or that there isn't value there. If you write a book about dragons and somebody says, I don't like dragons, well, that's not useful criticism. Yeah. But if they, if they read it and go, your character, I didn't understand why your character did what they did, yeah. well, that's, I mean, that's actually really useful feedback. But then something going back, looking about, all right, so this, is, this makes sense. I had a, an author friend of mine say to me that, to make peace for the fact, according to her, make peace for the fact that for the first 10 years of your writing, and uh, it's just as a number, for the first 10 years of your writing, it's not going to be very good what you produce, because it takes you a, a long time to get to that stage where you discover your voice, and it becomes something worthwhile. I mean, for you, how long did it take? <laughs> I was going to say, does that mean that everything I've produced is not very good? No, you started <laughs> when you were in high school. Sure, you that's true, that's true. So, so I'm maybe much. finally starting to get there. No, I mean... I don't know, you know, some people come straight out of the gate and their stuff is great. Mm. Um, and like, you know, it's okay to hate those people a little bit, but also, you know, <laughs> but also Just be friends best. with those people, right? Because yes. um, you can probably learn something interesting from them. And I don't know, I, I am a big fan of learning in public. Like, and it makes it harder because it means that you are failing in public constantly, but you know, I like to learn on the job. Like, my, my first novel that I ever wrote was also the first novel that I published. Um, you know, and I think there is some value to that. Um, I recognize that I've been very fortunate in that regard um, and that it could easily have gone another way, right? Like, the, the third novel I wrote still has never seen print and may not, mm -hmm. right? So that's a different kind, type of terror. When, just when you think, like, oh, I definitely can't fail at this point, yeah. And then you realize you can still fail. You can always still fail. It doesn't get easier. I don't know if you remember a film called The Player, uh, Tim Robbins in it. In the, the whole premise of the film is Tim Robbins steals the idea from another author, and I think he kills the other person or something, but he ended up, he's paranoid for the rest of the film trying to find out if people know what he's done. One of the characters in the story says to him, when you're writing a novel, all you need to care about, when you're, getting, when you're getting published, all you need is that one ridiculously lucky break. Thereafter, you can write whatever you want and get away with it. How true is that sentiment? False. Very false. False Excellent. entirely. You are never too big to fail. Um, you're never too big to... Uh, I know authors that, for instance... Um, you know, Piers Anthony is an interesting one, where, like, those Xanth novels were huge, and he was a big name for a long time. And nowadays, he, you know, he could probably still sell Xanth novels, but he can't sell anything else to save his life, right? And I know authors that have hit it big, and then their series kind of tanked, and then they had to kind of start from scratch. Um, and anything can happen. Uh, I... I want to end this on an inspirational yeah, it's, note. It's but I, <laughs> what, I want, what I'm also curious about is that when you, just from a realistic perspective, when you write to a publisher or you write to an agent, what should you say in that initial email or letter or whatever, a pigeon that you throw through their window, whatever message you send to them, what should you say when you're contacting them? What shouldn't you say? I'll get back to that, but I figured out the inspirational ending to what I was saying before. Fantastic. Okay, so... Um, the important thing to remember is you talk about that one stroke of luck and then you'll be good forever. That's not how it works. You need a continual series of lu lucky strikes. But here's the thing about luck. Luck is only useful in publishing if you also have the work ethic and the, the sort of drive to capitalize on it. Like, what you can do in publishing is to make sure you're always ready when you get that lucky break make sure that you're ready to jump on it, right? Like when a publisher says, oh, I'd like to see your stuff, have a novel ready that you can send them the next day. You know, when an, when an agent says, oh, you know, you meet at a convention and they go, oh, that would be cool if you, if you did something. Mm -hmm. Be ready to turn around and email them and just be, be capitalizing on that moment. Because I think that's what a lot of it is about is, you know, lucky breaks come along all the time. 
It's do you do anything Capitalizing with them. on it. Um, so anyway, so back when you were saying to what you say when you query somebody, yes. um, it depends on the type of project. Uh, if you're trying to publish short stories, you don't need to say anything. You just send an email and say, hey, I'm so-and-so and this is my story attached, and that's it. Um, if you're trying to sell a novel, what you generally send is a query letter um, to both agents and publishers where you say, hey, here is a paragraph of who I am, you know, what I've, what I've done, if I have any credits, it's okay if you don't. Um, and then here is a couple paragraphs of what my novel is about, and that's it. You just send that, you send either the full manuscript, if they request that, or the first couple chapters, like every editor or agent will have on their website, uh, you know, guidelines for what they want to see. And usually it'll be something like, please send, three chapters and a synopsis, or please send the entire manuscript. And just follow directions. The number one thing you can do in the publishing industry to make a good impression is follow directions exactly. And sometimes people will even put in weird stuff, right? Like sometimes people will say, I only read manuscripts that are formatted in uh, Courier New. So go ahead and format in Courier New. You know, like do whatever you need to do. Or somebody will say like, I don't want to see your name on the manuscript. I just want to see, uh, okay. because, they, because they want to read it blind, right? They don't want to be biased. Okay. Um, and so they say, you know, put it in your cover letter, but yes. then take it off the manuscript. Okay. And so by following those instructions, um, you know, you, mi you might think it's very weird that somebody would say only, you know, I only read novels submitted in this font, but for a lot of them, what they're doing, sometimes they're just actually that picky. More often what they're doing is finding out can you read instructions? Can you follow instructions? Because they want to know if they're going to have a good time working with you. And if you're somebody who doesn't bother to read the guidelines for how to submit stuff, they already know before they've read word yeah. one of your book that you're going to be a problem child to work with. Um, so that's actually following instructions, meeting deadlines. These are the things that editors dream of. And having a good book is like a bonus. So it's, it's, we spoke about this uh, yesterday. It's the, it's the old, it's the set of rules that was given to Nicolas Cage when he was becoming an actor. Be on time, know your lines, don't bump into the furniture. So if you're an author, deliver to deadline, deliver according to the spec, yeah. and don't be an ass. Yeah, that that is basically it. And you know, sometimes people will say, "Oh, you can have." Yeah, old joke is you can have. Two out of the three, right? Like, as long as you're really talented, you can be a jerk, you know, uh, as long as you meet deadlines, you know. But I, I generally say you really need all three in this day and age, like, because there are so many authors out there. There are so many novels that are great waiting to be published. Um, you need to make sure that you are being the easiest, most fun person to work with possible kind of all the time. I mean, you work in publishing. How often do you get stuff in a day? How many things do you get across your desk? Well, it depends because I don't, these days, I, uh, you know, I don't do open calls right, right. now. Like, I'm, I'm commissioning all the books that we get directly from authors that I choose that I say, uh, you know, you, I go to them and say, I would like you to write a book for us. Um, but when I did have an open call, when we did short fiction for Pathfinder, um, I had a thing that I referred to as the Tower of Shame. Um, and the shame was mine because it was, you know, a stack of these uh, writing samples from people and it would just grow higher and higher and I never had the time to actually read all of it. So it would just continue to build like the Tower of Babel. Um, so and then, what'd you do? I was ashamed. Oh, that was okay. hence the name. <laughs> then, like, I never had the, you know, the time to to get all the way through it. Um, How tall did the tower get? Real tall. That, that tall. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, any further questions? Yeah. It was, yes, there we go. Here's some questions. There's one in the uh, back. Yeah, it's microphones over yet? There we are. Here, uh, here. Here. Yeah, it's on. You can pass that on to this. I Thank should you just walk much. around the audience and do this like talk show style. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and then yeah, just pass yeah. it back as you go. So I've got a question about the way you guys choose authors. You look at the big publishing companies that are based around games, like Dungeons and Dragons and Games Workshop. They always choose yeah. the same select authors with certain themes. Why do they choose the known authors as opposed to letting new bloods give it a hand? So uh, the main reason why you choose a known author is because they're a known quantity. Because you have proof, A, a they have fan base and maybe you like their work, but B, they have proof that 
they can do the work, they can do it on time, and they can do it of consistent quality. Um, you know, we do try and use new authors. I've published a number of new authors. Um, I've published a number of authors that were successful but outside of the gaming tie-in field. Um, but in general, especially with tie-in, people want authors that they know can do the job because it's not, you know, w with publishing original fiction, like, if it takes you 10 years to write the book, that's fine because the publisher isn't involved until the very end. But in tie-in fiction, the publisher is like saying, I need this done on a deadline. And if you're an unknown quantity, uh, they can't afford to have you potentially like decide halfway through, oh, you know, I guess I don't like writing novels that much. Sorry, uh -oh. later. Um, and, th and that happens with new authors a lot, so. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, this, it, this may not be quite on topic, but I mean, like, you've written for a lot of things, maybe, um, just for interesting, what have you written on actually before? Because you say you've also done like small writing passages for other things outside of you. Know, yeah. You're working now. Yeah, I've I've done a bunch of stuff. So I've done um, my two novels are both uh, with Pathfinder. Um, I've also written some creator-owned novels that are currently being shopped around with my agent. Um, I've written comics again uh, for several different Pathfinder series. Um, I've written a bunch of short stories for different venues. Um, there are some really good short fiction magazines, places like uh, Apex Magazine or Beneath Ceaseless Skies or various places that specialize in short fiction. Um, probably the biggest one I did was this book called Machine of Death, um, which was an anthology that actually became the, uh, the number one bestseller on Amazon for like 36 hours or something. Uh, it, was a, it was a very big deal because we uh, got, uh, there's a political commentator in, uh, in the United States named Glenn Beck. Oh, um, wow. And we knocked him out of the top spot, his biography. That he, on its own deserves a round of applause. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if, it, uh, yeah, if you guys know about it, but uh, it was funny because he had like a public meltdown on his radio show about the fact that our book dislodged him from the number one oh, spot. The so that was really Beck our claim. works for Fox, doesn't he? Say what? Glenn Beck works for Fox News, doesn't he? Uh, he used to, yeah. yeah. Say no more. Yeah, exactly. But so that was that was a very probably my proudest short story moment. Um, but yeah, and then I've done also some writing for uh, I write for video games right now. There's an app game called uh, Castle Creeps that is like a tower defense game that I write for. Uh, kind of do a little bit of everything. Um, and I have written for some other game companies, but these days I tend to focus on Pathfinder and Starfinder just because a I know the system real well. I can get away with doing kind of whatever I want. Mm. Uh, and also, it, it pays better than most other RPG companies, so. Question in the back. Cool. Um, this is also a bit off topic. What would you say the difference is between writing for RPGs in terms of technical writing as opposed to novel writing? What sort of things are publishers looking for on those sort of fronts? I mean, in terms of the assignments are very different, but in terms of the talents involved, I'd say they're very similar. Um, now, adventure writing stuff, obviously they're going to be looking to n see that you have a mastery of the system uh, so that you can make good stat blocks, you can make good rules, whatever it is you're trying to do for the game design, obviously. But then just in terms of the writing itself, um, yeah, good writing is good writing. They want evocative world building, um, generally avoid passive voice, you know, just uh, the di major difference is just when you're writing adventures, you have to remember that the story you're telling is not nearly as important as the play experience. Um, and so you want to make sure that the characters are always at the center of the action, that it's really all focused on them. You don't want to present a whole bunch of history and the backstory of your adventure if there's no way for the players to find it out, that kind of thing. Oh, there we go. Hey, finally, I'm going to ask a question. Woo! Um, being an editor and a writer at the same time, can you hear me? I, uh, yeah, yeah. Perfect. Okay. Being an editor and a writer, both, yeah. do you edit as you write and does that, if you do, does that seem to be more helpful or does it kind of get you off track? Um, you know, for me, I tend to focus on just get all the book out first um, and then go back and edit it. Like I'll sometimes read back over, you know, the last page uh, in order to you know, remind myself of where I am and keep going each day. Uh, but I really think some of my coworkers, they, they write by 
they'll write, you know, from the start, they'll go, and then they'll stop. And then the next day, they'll start editing at the beginning, and then write a little bit more, and then stop. And they'll just do that over and over again. And it's madness, because it takes them 10 times as long to write the book. Um, so I really feel like if editing is slowing you down, leave it. You know, I, I went through a phase early on before I was uh, able to sort of divorce that part of my brain. Um, I would sometimes, you know, either close my eyes when I was writing or turn my chair. So, like, I swear some of my early stories I literally wrote like this. Because that way I couldn't get distracted by seeing the words on the page, right? Like, it was just straight brain into computer. Um, although you got to be careful with that, because if your key hands get moved on the keyboard, you can waste a whole lot of work. <laughs> Send it through your But yeah, I, I say do whatever works for you, but I highly recommend just write all the words first, because editing can be uh, a time sink. Anybody else? Other questions? Oh, there yeah, we go. Yeah. Um, I imagine that you guys are based in the United States. Um, yeah. Do you guys work with uh, writers or artists outside of the United States? All the time. Yeah, actually, I'd say um, for our authors, we have a number of international authors, but for our artists, it's primarily international. We work a lot with um, artists from, like, Eastern Europe, Korea, uh, Asia, like, Africa, kind of everywhere, honestly. Uh, Art is especially easy in that regard because it's pretty universal. Um, like, for instance, I think all of the all of the comics artists I've worked with, with the exception of Sean Isaacs, uh, who's here in Johannesburg, I think all of them have been from South America because there's a big, uh, like, Brazilian comics scene. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, for writing, it's a little bit harder because, obviously, uh, if you're if you're from somewhere where English is not the first language, you're still going to be held to the same standards of English as yeah. a native speaker. Um, but sometimes, you know, sometimes that's fine. Like there are plenty of native speakers who don't write well, and there's plenty of non-native speakers who write better. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, no, it's absolutely not a problem. Okay. And um, how would uh, a writer from outside the United States? Uh, get into contact with you guys? Is it just like via your website? Email is universal. Yeah, it's just uh, it's one of those things where uh, it, depending on the project you want to do, there's different ways. Like if you're trying to write for game stuff, uh, Pathfinder specifically, Pathfinder Society, we've got an open call, which is how people generally, uh, you pitch adventure ideas and then they give you assignments. Um, that's the main way in these days. Uh, also, working for sort of third-party publishers. There are a lot of smaller publishers that do Pathfinder-compatible stuff, and that can be a really good way to sort of get your foot in the door and get some portfolio pieces that then you can show us, like, hey, not only am I interested, but I've already done some work for this. Uh, so that's my recommendation for the game writing side. And similarly, if you want to write tie-in novels, or you know, if you wanted to write a Pathfinder novel or a Starfinder comic or whatever, the best thing you can do is go out and sell your own stuff first. Like, sell some short stories, prove that you can f complete the task and that other people found your work sort of worthwhile. Uh, that does a lot to get you in the door with editors and get your stuff actually read and considered. One question I've been dying to ask you, in the time that you've been writing and you create characters, has there ever been a character that you argued with yourself as whether or not to kill? Argued whether or not to kill a character. The example I give is an author that I like called Matthew Riley, where one of his principal characters is, gets killed. It's the third book along in the series. He says, it took me three weeks of arguing with myself and my fiance before I finally was able to do it, and then I had to not write for two weeks because I was angry with myself. Huh. Have you ever gotten that invested? No, in no, I've never done that. I, I tend to outline pretty heavily, so uh, if anything, I have the reverse problem, where from the beginning of the book, it's like, oh, no, that guy's doomed. I know, I, know, <laughs> I, I can't get attached to him. I know what's going to happen. Like, oh, you seem so nice. If only you knew. Cool. Are there any other questions? Yes, one on the back there. Uh, Microphone. She's got it. Stuff like NaNoWriMo? I think NaNoWriMo is awesome if it works for you. Um, and I know a lot of people that really get into it. So for folks that don't know, Na that's National Novel Writing Month, where you basically write an entire novel in a month. And it's just like this, there's this big community, everybody's very supportive, and you just 
pound out the words every day so that you've got, at the end of the month, 50,000, you know, words of a novel. Um, I think that that's awesome if it works for you. Personally, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't fit with my lifestyle, um, but it can be a great way to, if, if you have trouble setting deadlines, if you have trouble making yourself work, it's a nice to have that outward structure imposed on you. Um, so I think if it works, great. Um, you know, I, instead of, you know, novel writing month, I tend to have like novel writing life. So I give myself <laughs> permission to work at a slower pace, but really whatever works for you. All right, All right. question over there. Ah, yes. Um, so when you're creating a character for your stories, um, you know, you get characters like Luke Skywalker who's green behind the ears, there's lots of potential ahead of him. You can take him and mold him and shape him, and you know, he grows as the story grows. But with characters who are grizzled veterans, people who have come a long way in life, how do you approach writing them? I mean, how, what is your procedure for molding their character? Oh, I think I actually do. I tend to gravitate towards those others, right? Like, both of my novels are about that sort of, like, grizzled, cynical, veteran-type character. Um, I think that, I think it's fun. I think you just gotta really get into their mindset and figure out what they've seen, what they've done, why they feel the way they do, what is sort of the conflict at the center of their, of their personality, because everybody's got something that is the thing that bugs them, the thing that they, they wanna be better at, you know, just figuring out sort of uh, those hopes and dreams. Like, uh, one of the things about, um, so my, my two novels that I've got out now are both, uh, they're about uh, an atheist detective in a world where gods are objectively real. And so it's this, it's this guy who hates the gods. He resents the fact that they impose their will on mortals and all these things. But through some bad decisions, he ends up actually working against his will for the death goddess. And so he's tracking down souls that have gone missing, um, you know, bouncing around the afterlife, heaven and hell and whatnot. Um, but the thing that I enjoy so much about that character is that he really is kind of self-hating. You know, he's, here he is doing magic and like being, being a divine servant, but he really resents the gods and he resents his role. You know, he's sort of this like, uh, almost like sort of a, a cop that's been beaten down by the system, right? Like you still work within the system, but you kind of hate it too. Um, and so he's got this real thread of self-loathing that makes him a fun hero to write because even though he's doing these heroic things, he's kind of disgusted with himself all the time. Um, and so, I don't know, I think, I think that sort of conflict in the character can be really fun. Also, uh, obligatory plug, those books are Death's Heretic and The Redemption <laughs> Engine. Uh, you can purchase them on the internets or places. Fantastic. So, any other questions? About out of time. I th yeah, I think we're pretty much out of time. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for coming through to what is our final panel for today. We'll be doing more tomorrow. And if you have more questions, you can always find me on Twitter at James L. Sutter. Indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, James Sutter.